the country music fans who obviously you will leave behind with this album. Uh, will you, are you sorry to see them go if they do go? First of all, I think the majority of my fan base is not a country audience, I think. And if they were, they weren't there because I was in the top 40 or the top 10. They mm -hmm. were there because they were interested in me as a vocalist and me as a personality. Um, I think that even I, when I have a favorite artist and they make an album, I don't always understand each album. I'm going to win some, I'm going to lose some, but I, I have a feeling that the majority of my fans, previous fans, are going to come with me. And the new ones? The new ones I will embrace with loving and open arms. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to what tunes you will do, what tunes won't you now do live? I probably won't do Johnny Get Angry anymore. <laughs> I know it's sad, but I've been doing it for seven years. It's time to say goodbye. You know I love you. create some of the tunes. You've got strings in there and everything. What are you going to do? Well, um, I'm taking nine pieces, so I can't take strings because it's expense. It's just too, too much. But I think that they'll evolve. You know, it's a basically a large Jaws ensemble, and it will, you know, the songs will evolve, and they'll, they'll become their own thing. It's always different on stage. This show's going to be more about, you know, less kinetic, less, you know, the entertainment package, which I was totally into. <laughs> but... Uh, it's going to be more uh, creating a hypnotic ambience and, and sucking people in and, uh, and staying there with them in sort of a, a womb. Is it possible to describe Ben Mink's value in this music? No. Ben Mink is ultimately important to this record and, in my opinion, is a genius musician and songwriter. Um, the funny thing about it is, is that I don't... It, it doesn't, it's the combination, it's the chemistry between us um, that is the special thing. Um, like when, when I got off the road in 1990 on May 28th, I basically said to the reclines, I'll talk to you after I'm done the film, which was in a year's time. I got off the road, I got back from Europe uh, and I phoned Ben and I said, well, I'm done the film. And we started talking about music, and our thoughts were completely parallel about what we were doing. And I wasn't even sure I was going to write with him, but it was just so obvious that he was still right with me that it, I just said, come on out. And we wrote the record. I started writing in January of last year, and then it, we finished in June. So th this record is, is different because it, it is a cohesive body of work. It's an actually edited piece of my life put on vinyl um, and a, you know uh, it was written and recorded within 11 months which is not bad not bad <clears throat> you and Ben you write write to a mood as much as music yeah that's it's this album wasn't the thing about writing this record is that it was totally absent of any real outside force when we write when we wrote this record, it was really about innocence and naivety and just really letting our primal instincts take over. We weren't really thinking about anything on the outside when we are actually writing a song. During the demoing process and the arranging process, maybe, but never during the actual sort of birthing. Were you surprised at the things the songs revealed? No. Because I know that you work on a kinetic energy kind of thing. With yeah, I you, do. You and Ben and, and uh -huh. kind of throw the pieces of paper on the floor and, mm -hmm. well, sometimes there's no lyrics and it's, if it doesn't work, you go home. Right. It's, I, I think we were both, I think we're still surprised. I think that, you know, I think that even during the middle of the writing process, we didn't know exactly what was happening. I mean, we'd get glimpses of exactly what we were doing, but never a full focus, and we'd just keep 
creating these pieces and, and these sounds and would go to would go to the CD stores and buy like thousands of CDs and like just go through them really fast and sometimes it would take like Hawaiian music and put it over Kurt Vile and see what it sounded like, you know, like put it on two different channels and mix them together and get all these ideas for new sounds and I mean that's more Ben's thing. Ben's more into that. The arranging. Yeah, and like doing technical stuff. I'm more into like walking through the Stanley Park in Vancouver and getting ideas for Season of Hollow Soul, you know. Did you have problems singing these tunes? Yes. Why? You're a singer. Well, because now, um, okay, I have two reasons, okay. One, because I, I went through a period where I was singing these songs and I, I was singing them from so inside, from so introspective and so deeply that I, w I was singing flat. My pitch was terrible. And Ben and Greg, every time they'd just go, <laughs> no. <laughs> and I'd get really upset. And, and two, it was, now I think it was because of two things. One, the actual physical problem, I had a root canal which was, uh, uh, I needed a root canal, which was like pushing on my station tube back here in my ear mm -hmm. and cutting off some high frequency. Because the voice is so, 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 so tender and tricky that weather and so many things, you know, that it was pushing and they're cutting my high frequency down in my ear so my pit, I wasn't hearing the real high end stuff, so I couldn't balance. And the other reason was is that I was singing from the pain of the writer. And I was singing flat because I was singing from pain. And then I went away to Europe to promote the film, came back, and during the process of Europe, realized that that's what I was doing and, and had to become the singer, the interpreter, sing from an optimistic overtone so that my pitch came back up. It was a very big struggle and scary. I thought maybe this was it as a vocalist. Maybe I thought, God, is this it? But it finally came back, and Ben and Greg were supportive and very hard on me and i thank god that they were hard on you yeah drove you drove me set my standard really really high and made me achieve it you know the picture of you backstage at the commodore with the banana in my pants no well yeah sure <laughs> with the hat <laughs> Le uh, leaning on the in the, the yeah, green polyester yeah, suit yeah yeah uh-huh does that person exist anymore yeah definitely you sure yeah yeah, sometimes when I'm on my Harley or when I'm out running around my farm, I'm definitely that geeky farm boy, totally. Still, it never will go away. I mm. think, you know, I am, I am a 5 foot 9, 150 pound combination of molecules that will never change, just different ones surface. You know, they're still in there. They're just kind of reshape and restructure but I you know no definitely I'm still a geeky farm boy inside big bone gal big bone gal the video for constant craving if the album is as different as it is I assume that the video will be as well I'm, I'm moving to another level of video yes I'm spending more money <laughs> so that, that basically you know means the next level that doesn't always connotate there's going to be a better, you know, we, we've seen No, it doesn't good. mean better. It just means that I'm, I'm spending more time on it when I have to make a decision of whether or not I want a shot because it costs an extra $10,000. I'm saying yes because I want the shot now. I mean, it's just, I'm gambling on this one. I want, I want it to be the way I want it. I want it to be the way the director wants it. And so, you know, in a situation, the artist is responsible for 50% of the money of a video. So, you know, I just, I feel like I just want to, make this really something special. This is a special record and I just want to go for it this time.